so I So um, first of all, let me just uh, uh, say a note of uh, thanks to the Stanford folks. Uh, if you've looked through the Stanford materials, you realize they put in, pretty much put everything online. They put their lecture loads online. They put their videos on YouTube. Uh, they put their uh, class project descriptions online. Everything is there. So the materials, the, all the raw materials are already there for you. And it's just that uh, we at NUS think that uh, it's good to put together the community. So I hope over the next uh, 13 weeks or so, uh, 10 weeks left in the semester or so that uh, we get all a chance to, to come together and learn from each other. And part of that is not in the classroom learning, a part of that is because we are a community in Singapore who cares about deep learning, we would like to offer you some type of uh, chances to interact rather than just study. Okay, and uh, as I said, I, I, I approached the Stanford lecturers, Fei Fei Li, Justin Johnson, and Serena, and th they were okay with us running this. I mean, obviously, they've put all the material online, so I don't think they they don't want it to happen, but uh, we've gotten express co uh, consent from them to hold this course. So um, just to be clear about it, uh, usually as a, a faculty member in NUS, I'm not allowed to teach people who are not at NUS. Right, because NUS charges monetary fees. Okay, so if you wanted to do executive education, you'd have to actually pay. But because all of the material is put up by Stanford, uh, we are just basically a big study group. Okay, that's that's in fact what we are. And uh, basically, what we are going to do in this course is ask all of you to teach the course and all of you to be the audience to ask questions. Okay, so in order for this course to work, it's not me lecturing. Okay, it's uh, you guys channeling your inner Fei Fei Li, your inner Justin uh, Johnson, your inner Serena Young be, being uh, Vision PhD students, and giving the lecture. Okay, and it's not hard to do because, as I said, they've already put up the lectures. You just need to watch it and then pretend that you know what's going on and give the lecture. Okay. All right. So there are some obligations of this course. Okay, because uh, otherwise it doesn't work. All right. So um, each person in this group is going to be part of two groups, okay? One group to do the presentation during that week of lecture, okay? And I'll go over this with you uh, later. So that means you're going to watch the Stanford video, okay? And then you're going to partition the slides among the group that is doing it, okay? So maybe there's four of us in, in one uh, lecture who are going to take up one-fourth of the slides and we're going to present each of those slides in turn and you'll be responsible for being able to answer questions on it. Okay. Separately, in, in a different week during that course, you have to select one of the uh, other weeks to raise questions. Okay, And this is just to help the uh, presentation group uh, make more use of that. Okay. So uh, where does this go? Um, this is on, let me see where I can find it. On the, uh, in Slack, you probably would have seen it already. There is this worksheet here, okay, that uh, we want you to add in uh, information about uh, where you're from, okay? So if you haven't accessed this worksheet, please do so. Um, there's a link on the, the Slack uh, group for this. And basically, you have to put in your name, right? Your affiliation, whether you're going to be for here for the first half, the second half, or the whole thing. Okay, so I guess most external people will be here for the whole thing. And then which weeks you're signing up for. Okay, so you have to put in two weeks over here. Okay, and then if you want your, your name or your website advertised or linked in uh, some way on the main page, uh, I will help do that. I will put your name up. Um, on the web page so that uh, potential employers might be interested in hiring you and, and letting you know. Okay, but uh, this is your preferences. I will be the one doing the allocation. Okay, my allocations will come over here um, when I decide uh, and, and then it will be broadcasted here. So you will have noticed, uh, hopefully, that some of your names actually already appear here. So for example, week four, which is next week, 4th of September, um, oops, We have uh, Devamanyu uh, Siddhar, uh, Ming Rui, uh, Yachi, Kenev, and Kok Kyung, uh, who will be giving the presentation. Okay, so if you're here, 
Hopefully you can raise your hand so people know who you are. One, two, three. Anyone else from this lecture group? Okay, so you guys will uh, need to join the channel in Slack for that week. So for example, let's, let's pretend I'm one of you here. Then what I will do is uh, when I open Slack, okay, and let's say I go to the deep learning course, right? Uh, you'll see a number of channels. Okay, you'll see a number of channels on the left-hand side that indicate specific weeks that uh, uh, are preparation. So you need to join the weeks that your questioner or uh, um, a questioner or a, uh, uh, a presenter. So for week four, if I'm a questioner or presenter, I would uh, join this group, okay, and then uh, arrange some time to to do some discussion around preparing for the questions and preparing for the presentations. Okay, so um, before you leave today, hopefully everyone has filled out this worksheet so that we can do the logistics for organizing the class. Okay, so um, aside from that, okay, as I've already said before, there is actually the, the videos are all online, so you can go to YouTube. Uh, you can download all the videos if you want. This is what I do since I, sometimes I'm mobile, I, I don't have connection. Then uh, watch the appropriate lecture and um, uh, and decide how you're going to partition it. So uh, over the last two weeks, uh, we've already covered uh, lecture one, lecture two, and lecture three, uh, which I, I've casted to YouTube. Okay, they're already on YouTube anyways from the Stanford lectures, but I've casted it again. Um, so you can watch those if you want. Uh, and today we're going over uh, lecture four on uh, introduction to neural networks. Okay, um, another thing that we're asking all external presenters to do, can I have a show of hands who's not from NUS and is participating as an external guest? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so all of you who are not from NUS, what we are asking you to do is do a publicly disclosable project to be presented at the end of the class session. So in week 13, uh, which is reading week in NUS, we typically have this uh, module showcase where graduate and uh, advanced undergraduate classes show off what they've done in their classes through a poster presentation. And I'll give you more details about that later. But basically what you want to do is actually try to get your hands dirty, do some of the assignments or come up with a project that you think could take between 5 to 10 hours of work on your own. Um, and do that project and then come up with uh, a, a poster to present it, okay? And we will um, then allocate part of the, the, the workshop, uh, sorry, this uh, pres uh, project presentation showcase, which is common to all of the modules in NUS that's under the School of Computing, and, and you'll be able to showcase what you've done, okay? So to help with this, again, Stanford has kindly done, done a lot of work for that. Um, you probably have already seen that their class has uh, a number of uh, of projects that they have shown. So um, you go here under project reports. You can click this one, and uh, you can look at take a look at some of the the projects that they've done. Okay, and these these have been individual or, or, uh, projects of team of two. And uh, basically, you can uh, take some of these projects and decide that you want to do it. Basically, what you need to do is come up with a data set that you want to try learning over, uh, come up with a, a potential architecture that you think uh, would be useful for that. Okay, So there are many ways to get that type of architecture. You could go to GitHub and look for source codes that's already runnable. You could uh, look at uh, any recent papers. You could look at you know TechCrunch or whatever news feeds you look at and say, okay, that looks like fun. I want to try that and, and take that on. Okay, And uh, all it is is, uh, because we're not asking you to do a lot in this course, is uh, getting the data set. Uh, you probably already know that once you have a data set, there's a lot of work to get it into a usable form, right? So you have to do the post uh, pre-processing to get it into a form that's uh, useful for a neural network to process, then run it through the neural network, show the results, and maybe do a little bit of analysis why it works, why it doesn't. 
okay? And, and so that, that's the extra commitment that will require all guests to do that, okay? It could be related to your work. If you have work uh, that uh, involves machine learning, as long as it's publicly disclosable, right? Okay? Uh, for the NUS students, who here is NUS? Everyone hands up high? Okay, so all of you who are in NUS, uh, we encourage you to do it. And if you don't think it's uh, easy for you to do it on your own, uh, many of you are first year students, then team up with other people at your table. Okay, and, and I, I encourage you to do it because the, the theoretic underpinnings make a lot of sense, but without practice, which is a very different uh, and complementary source of knowledge, it won't make a lot of sense to you. Okay, hopefully through this class you get a bit of both. Because I think we have a lot of data scientists there who can use the libraries but have no idea what's going on. And that's also bad. That's bad science. It's, it's bad engineering if you don't understand the basis for what you're doing. Okay? So um, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to share for, uh, with the course organization. Any questions that you guys have? So the course will always be uh, Tuesday nights. 6 to 8 p.m. Okay, the lectures themselves, if, if you watch the YouTube videos, they're only about an hour long anyways. So we have plenty of time to ask, you know, what we consider our stupid questions, right? The stupid questions will keep us going, right? If we're not all on board with the math, that's okay. Okay, there's some prerequisite that we're going to assume that you have. You probably need to know at least some linear algebra. You need to know some calculus and, and be able to do, uh, do some numerical calculations. And then uh, if you're not sure about it, well, that's okay. Take the course, try to brush up, ask people around you. I mean, this is why we are a community in Singapore, right? We're, we're not trying to, you know, bash each other over the head because you don't know advanced math. That's okay. okay. Uh, and then try to go, go, go ahead and, and get something out of the course. All right? Uh, it should be interactive. So I, I hope you guys can ask questions and uh, give us some feedback. Nothing? Okay. All right, so uh, we're going to cover uh, the lecture slides. And I may need a bit of help myself because I only watched half of the lecture. I was busy preparing another course this afternoon um, on this. Oh, that's right. Not this one. Um, Okay, so we're going to go over backpropagation and neural networks today. So I hope uh, uh, you had a chance to look through this, but not um, that's okay. So let's just remind ourselves where we are uh, with respect to what we discussed last week. Okay, um, first we have to think about what type of architecture we're doing for our learner, right? So um, we can think of it as having um, some data x which could be in a data matrix format, right? We have rows representing instances. Those instances might have particular features. So this X vector might have, uh, you know, D dimensions, for example, okay? Uh, and we have a set of weights that, that we're going to have as inputs. These are what the learning algorithm is going to return, okay? Uh, as a, a parametric model that models how we're going to take that input, um, use some type of function to generate a label for it, and that, that would be the return of the function, right? Basically, what Y, what class, if we're doing supervised learning, it, it will match, okay? And uh, so far, we've been pretty much talking only about uh, linear models. Linear models meaning that we take the data, X, and we uh, find some uh, way of linearly combining using the weights uh, some, some function where we add and multiply things together, and uh, together with that, we get an output that we're going to call a score, right? And uh, we talked about two different loss functions uh, last week. We talked about the SVM multi-class loss, which looks like this, and hopefully you're familiar with that, but if not, basically what we, we said is um, it represents this type of hinge loss. Okay, so I um, can draw it here, something like that okay so um, if 
the boundary between the actual class, SYI is the correct classification for this point, and um, another class, which is not the correct uh, class, if the separation in score is above a certain margin, then it's considered correctly classified. Right? So, for example, if I'm looking at an image of a car, okay, that's the correct class, and all of the other classes that it could be are all much less than the probability or score that I output for car. That's correctly classified. There's no error. Okay, that that would be over here. That that would be the maximum amount, which would be zero. Okay, in the cases where the margin is not so good, for example, the negative class. Let's say uh, the image looks a little bit like a cat, but also looks a little bit like a car. But the margin between these two scores is not very large. Then we're going to consider that too low of a threshold. Okay, and that means there's a loss. Okay. So that will be an, in the case of this, and basically we take the max of these two, okay, which is basically giving us that hinge looking like function that I just drew for you. Right, maybe I should draw it on the board. Okay, hinge lock. So again, if the margin of the score, SJ minus SYI, is uh, greater in a certain amount, and then we have a zero loss. This is our loss. Okay, over here. And then if the margin is small, then we have a linear loss, right, depending on how bad it is. After we get to this point, it means that the, uh, one of the other classes has a bigger confidence value than, than the actual class. So that's definitely misclassified on, on this side. Okay. So there were two different losses that we introduced. SVM a loss was one of them. So um, you can think of that as one component. Okay. So we call that loss a loss for an individual uh, data point, LI. Okay. And uh, to get the total loss function, because all machine learners that we, we are currently thinking about in this paradigm are driven by uh, loss, okay, is we're going to take the loss of the individual point, okay, sum it up over all the data points, then average that to get an average individual point loss, okay, and that's going to be our loss value, okay, but we also have this other term over here, can anyone tell me what this term is for? Sorry, go ahead. Regularization, right? So what is regularization there for? Has everyone heard of this term before? So Zollin says it's to enforce model simplicity, right? We know that in machine learning, if we have a, a model that's too complex, it's likely to overfit the data and therefore not generalize. You know, it'll do perfectly well on the training data, but as soon as you go to ex uh, you know, external data, it's not going to work, right? You, you try it with uh, new images or, or new financial forecasting data and the model just drops. It doesn't work at all. So we want to prefer simpler models and this is one way to do this. This is a L2 regularization loss, which just says the weights that we're using here have to be fairly small in magnitude. Right? The larger the magnitude of the weight, the, the more budget is being eaten up by this particular coefficient. Right? This coefficient here will become larger, and then that will contribute to the loss. Okay? So we want this term to be small, which is enforcing very small coefficients to be attached to the model. In fact, it would be nice if some of them are zero, okay? so that we, we, will, we won't even use some of the features or use some of the coefficients in our learning model. Okay? And so all of that gets to the point where we have a loss. Right? So what do we do with this loss? Well, in machine learning, we want to minimize that loss. right? So the natural thing to do is to take uh, a minimum of that. And how do we do that? If we can't figure it out analytically, what we will do is we will do it uh, computationally, right? So what we can do is we'll take the gradient of the loss, which is what this is, with respect to w, with respect to our coefficients that we can change, right? Then figure out which direction in this space of w can we move to in order to minimize that loss, uh, minimize this value of loss. Right? So when we've got to the minimum point in our landscape, that represents the best that our classifier can do, 
given the constraints of how well it fits on the data and how simple the model is. Okay? All right. So uh, last time uh, uh, we saw this picture uh, where we had an optimization. You can think of uh, that's what we're trying to do numerically uh, when we can't give an analytic uh, closed form solution to the minimization problem then we have to search right so you can imagine we have this very large parameter space of w right maybe many dimensions and what we want to do is imagine it as some type of uh, uh, a surface or manifold that has many contours to it and we're going to just uh, start somewhere in this landscape and try to move around until we get to a minimum point Right? And uh, numerically, it might look more uh, like what you have on the right, where you have uh, calculated at some point the gradient. Let's say I start here as my uh, parameter w. right? So this w might have, for example, uh, oh, a w1 coordinate, uh, which is the x-axis, and a w2 coordinate in the y-axis if I only had two dimensions. Okay, and I'm going to take the gradient at this point where my current set of w1 and w2 are, I'm going to, uh, do the partial derivatives, and then figure out which direction should I go. Right? So maybe the gradient is pointing at this point this way. Okay? Gradients are the slope positive. So if we want to minimize the loss, then we have to go in the opposite direction of the gradient. So we're going to make a step in the opposite direction of the gradient, and we're going to go towards this direction over here, right? This way. Okay, and uh, depending on the step size, which you might hear about, we're going to take a step in certain direction, right, uh, negative to the gradient, stop there, reassess the gradient, right, and then take a step in uh, another following step. And that's how you get this curve, is that after a number of steps, the gradient is changing direction, and then we, uh, eventually we're converging to a local minimum. Okay? There are many ways to do this gradient descent, but that's basically the idea. The idea is, again, we don't have a closed form solution analytically to solve it, so we have to search, right? And then um, the vanilla gradient descent in Python is actually really, really simple. It looks like the bottom that you can see here, right? I'll read it to you in case you can't see it. It says, while true, so iterate forever until we get to a local optimum, change the weights uh, uh, by uh, first evaluating the gradient, you know, and to evaluate the gradient, you need the loss function, which we just showed on the last slide, the data and the weights. So we're getting the direction of the step, right? Then uh, we change the weights by just adding a component that equals to the gradient, which is here, and the step size. So we're taking a step in the opposite direction of the gradient, and we just continue this on and on until we get to a local minimum. Okay? Right. So in the lecture before, we said there's basically two ways of doing this. Okay, um, You can write a solver for this two ways. You can do it numerically, okay, which is basically you take a small step in one direction represented by this uh, you know, derivative. So you can say, I, I have this data x. I'm going to take a small uh, step in, in a particular direction. Okay and I'm going to calculate what my original loss function was and my new fu uh, loss function after I took the step. Okay, and then I'm going to look at their difference, right? This is basically the difference between the loss originally where I was at and at the new point. Okay, and I'm going to divide through by the step length and that's going to give me my numeric gradient for that particular direction, right? So the, the uh, partial derivative uh, for each of the components of x. All right? So that's fine. It's really easy to write because basically you're just invoking the loss function at two different points. Okay? But uh, it's really slow because you can imagine if you wanted to calculate the gradient, actually you have to go through all of the different dimensions. And uh, to calculate it uh, correctly with respect to the whole data set, you actually have to go through all of the data points. Right, so you have a large set like we do typically in deep learning, that's going to cost you a lot of time. Okay? So typically we, will, we won't do the numeric gradient um, uh, for, for the whole data set. Okay? If you can uh, divide, derive a closed form solution that is very fast, it's exact, but doing the calculations uh, to calculate the gradient analytically, sometimes we make mistakes in calculus. I do it all the time. 
Okay, so then uh, even when you program it, you know you're you're basically searching the wrong area, right? So um, it's good in practice to do both. Okay, you want to have uh, your objective is to do this: get the analytic gradient. Okay, so you go program that, and then you test it, but you test it against values that you can also compute this way. Okay. And uh, for small step sizes and small toy cases, you want these two different algorithms to give you the same value, right? Because they're doing the same thing, okay? But of course, you prefer the analytic one because it can get you exactly to the to right place, okay? In one step rather than um, over many steps, okay? So uh, our objective is to get the analytic gradient, but we are going to proof test it and make sure it's correct by calculating the numeric gradient. Okay. Later on, when we get to more complex neural networks, then obviously the analytic gradient becomes too hard to manage. Okay, and then we have to have other uh, ways of going back to the numeric gradient and, and making this low part go away, but it will still be approximate and easy to write. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with this idea of a computational graph, all right? So what that is is, uh, again, looking at the left-hand side here, we have a set of data, right, our x's, this is our data matrix, and we have a set of w, these sort of parameters that we're trying to learn for our neural network, okay? And they're going to be involved in some type of computation, right? Here is just a, um, uh, a product, right? And then uh, you can think of this as a unit of computation represented by this blue node. Okay, that's going to calculate this linear score that uh, we talked about, this S that we saw on the first slide. And then we can pass it through another calculation, let's say calculating the loss function here, a hinge loss that we showed earlier, which is in the red box. Okay, uh, and then doing that. And then also getting uh, information from R, okay, uh, over the W. Um, I'm not sure exactly what this represents. Does anyone remember? The what? Regularization, thanks, yeah. So the regularization part to make sure the model is um, at the right size uh, or not too complex, I'm going to add that together. And so basically in this computation class we, graph, we have four, four nodes where some computation is being done. Okay. Now we can split this computation up into more parts, like this hinge loss here has like got uh, you know, um, an addition, you know, summation, as a, well as a max, and, uh, and some other components. So we could blow up this particular node for hinge loss and, and call it uh, an even larger computational graph. Okay, it's up to us to define the uh, the granularity of the computational graph that we want. Okay, but this is just a method of thinking about what we are going to do. Okay, and, and so that really that architecture describes quite a lot of different architectures that we're going to see over this course. So for AlexNet, this was one of the first uh, uh, neural networks that spurred the big push into uh, deep learning, where basically we had uh, uh, the original uh, input image at the top. These were the pixels of, of the image. And we used uh, several layers of convolutional neural networks with different weights, all of these uh, Ws um, coming in. And then finally, when we get the classification at the very end of the network, then we're able to compute a loss. We're able to say whether that image was correctly recognized as a car or as a cat or as a tree. Okay, if it's correctly recognized, hopefully our loss will be zero. If it's not correctly uh, uh, recognized, we calculate the loss value, and now we have to use that loss value in some way to change our weights. Right? But how do we change the weights now? Because now the neural uh, the architecture is pretty deep. Right? We have to actually figure out how to change the weights here, 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 all with respect to this final outcome that came at the very end of our architecture. Right? So that is the hard part of, of doing the neural network training. And that's what we're covering today. And in fact, when you go to more recent models like the neural Turing machine, we can still think of it pretty much in the same guise, okay? That we have a computational graph that describes the calculations that we want to make, okay? And intrinsically, there's no difference. We still have an input image that we give, 
and we still have a loss function that we measure the fitness of our network and our parameters, and we still have to push this loss function all the way back up. So the same thing is applicable as we talked about earlier. You know, when we want to change the weights, do we change it here? Do we change it over here? Do we change it over here? Do we change it up here? In fact, we probably change it all over the place, but we don't know exactly uh, uh, at this point yet how we're going to change each of those weights. Okay, so backpropagation is going to get us there. Okay, and it gets more complex than that, right? A neural turning machine, that was just one image slice of how that uh, system is trained. But if you can imagine taking video or taking many uh, samples over time, we have to train the same procedure over many time steps, right? So we are going to calculate the loss at each one of these uh, Turing machine uh, instances and propagate that last uh, loss all the way back through the model and, and uh, tune off the parameters. Okay, everyone okay so far? Any questions? Please don't hesitate to ask because it will also save my voice. All the instances uh, are independent of each other, right? You're taking different images, and so why would you uh, combine the loss? Okay, are these all uncorrelated and independent of each other? You're asking that. And the answer is generally no, they're, they're dependent on each other. We, we typically think of um, uh, a CNN as a single set of parameters for all of the time instances. It's just that we would uh, push all the loss through all of these and come up with a single set of parameters W that would describe this neural Turing machine or this CNN over all the time steps. Okay. But that's not true for all neural networks. So, for example, later on when we get to recurrent neural networks, we're going to find that, uh, in fact, there might be some sensitivity to time step. Does that answer your question? Okay. There was another question in the back. So, machine learning, like you said, figuring out where the weight changes to over there, right? So, if we look at just Well, does it? Okay, so the question is uh, should we study just the basic uh, single neuron architecture and try to understand that well enough? Or should we be looking at uh, tuning the very large networks? Is, is, can I paraphrase that as that? I think both are valuable. I think definitely there's a concern that in deep learning, uh, and let me first say uh, I, I want to disclose that I'm not a vision researcher at all. I'm just doing this for fun because I like to learn. Okay, so uh, I don't know any better than most of you in the class. Okay, uh, I've just watched the video a couple hours before when I had to present. Okay, um, but I will say uh, based on uh, my exposure in natural language processing that I think. Both are valuable. If you look at the single uh, neuron and try to understand that better, you may get more basic research. Okay, uh, but uh, definitely there's this concern in deep learning that when you tune off these parameters, no one has a really good understanding of what's happening, right? What what how how to understand the network and uh, 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 get some performance guarantees from it. So I think there's a a lot of concern that you know when you use an AI system, you don't know what you're getting out at the end. You know, it may work better, but uh, that's all you can say about it, right? You, you don't have any guarantees about when it won't work, uh, and, and uh, what what bounds of performance it has. It has, does it have a theoretical guarantee to do to a certain level of performance? Okay, and can we understand the, the internals of this system? So for this neural Turing machine, maybe if I take out a, a specific component, let's say this component over here, what does that represent? Right. How, how do I understand that? So for example, in the uh, convolutional neural architecture that we showed uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we saw that when we push the weights back through the network, we can get uh, some type of prototype idea of what a car or an airplane or a horse looks like by pushing the weights back through and, and uh, trying to have it, uh, shall I say, hallucinate an image about what a prototypical car or an airplane looks like. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but I think in part uh, both are valuable. 
Yeah, uh, definitely when you get up to very large networks, you know, if you're talking about hundreds of layers, I don't think anyone really understands what's going on there. We just know that the performance gets better because of, of the types of non-linearities that can uh, capture. But whether those non-linearities are, are very helpful or whether they have a semantic basis for the problem uh, that's uh, uh, akin to our biological inspiration or, uh, or biological basis for vision, I, I think is anyone's guess. Other questions? Me too? Okay. Uh, like I agree with Min's point that both are equally important. Uh, so, what are we trying to model? That, that's the that's the basic question here, right? So we know we have empirical evidence. There is no theoretical uh, evidence, like Min suggested. But there are. Uh, so what was found was if you add more and more layers, we had better empirical performance. And what uh, and why is this said to have happened? Because the feature extraction is better. So as you know, in neural networks, we don't uh, have any hand-encoded features, especially in uh, image and speech research. We don't have any hand-encoded hand -coded features. So uh, with this, with the with a lot of lower-level features, we want to create abstractions, right? So the more layers you add, the more abstract the features are at the top layers. And this is also a basis for more advanced learning paradigms like transfer learning, where you train on one particular data set on one our own particular task, and then the features that are in the top layers on some other task okay so that's the answer for the deep question so on the cell question right so there are examples of uh, uh, where, where modifications to the perceptron or the cell itself gives you a better modeling power lsn is an example is an example for that uh, this is more popular in uh, in natural language processing literature uh, to expand long short term memory networks so people, you might be aware of that so even neural Turing machine or differential, uh, differential neural Turing machines are also examples uh, that build on top of LSDM, where uh, you, you try to mimic the biological uh, process of remembering things from long back. Okay, you want to uh, perceptron doesn't remember anything; it just uh, it, it models synapse, right? Now memory is something else that you can model in addition to synapse. So that's where uh, cell modifications come in. So just to add an example to what you're saying. So basically you're saying with an LSTM, mm -hmm. then if you, are, you can actually optimize at the level of the perceptron and reduce the information. Uh, okay, LSTM builds on top of a perceptron. So you, LS, uh, so there is a cell and you are controlling uh, what is written into the cell and what is read from the cell using gates. Okay, It is a crude approximation of long term memory that is modeled in our brains. Okay? Nobody knows how we remember things from long back. It's a crude approximation. There are more elegant uh, refinements to LSTM. For example, GR is a, it has fewer gates and it's more elegant. Right? Nobody knows what is the correct way to represent what we what we uh, think about, how we remember things. But yeah, uh, but there are limitations to how much you can remember in a particular cell. Right? Uh, for example, there are tasks in uh, natural language processing such as reading comprehension, where an LSTM is not good enough. Uh, the, a sequence length of about 50 to 100 is usually good enough. For L good LSTM performance, but uh, you have to go for people have showed that memory networks or neural Turing machines or differential Turing machines work much better. Where you actually write out the information to an external place, external memory, and then read them back in, right? It's just like uh, it is in a Turing machine. Okay, so those of you who didn't get any of that alphabet soup, don't worry, uh, we'll cover some of that later on. I think the important thing here is to understand that, you know, while neural networks are are biologically inspired, that's about it. That's the that's the extent to which they model neurons. You know, it's just the idea or the concept. So the the analogy that uh, people often make is about airplanes, right? Airplanes have wings. They were biologically inspired by birds, but we don't have airplanes that flap their wings, right? And similarly, our neural architectures don't mimic a lot of the biological inspiration for how the biology works. It's just a, a conduit for us to think about how, how we might do computation, right? And so when Mutu was talking about LSTM, that's another case, uh, and GRU is gated recurrent networks, uh, that's another case where we're taking some inspiration from you know, our biological primitives about memory, and then just trying to model it uh, abstractly. In fact, a lot of people in the neural network field have tried to stay away from the term neuron 
right? They, they have this uh, thing that they call a unit, right? They don't even call it a neuron anymore because they want to abstract away from that idea that everything is rooted in a biological uh, basis. It's not, okay? It's just a mathematical construct, and we use the math as a framework to think about doing the computation, okay? Other questions? These are good questions for us to think about strategically at a high level. Okay, so we're going to start with backpropagation because uh, that's a, a very hairy task that uh, is, is confusing for a lot of people. So how does it work? So let's pretend I have this function, which is a, a function of three variables, f, y, and z. And uh, the way I actually compute it is this uh, x plus y times z. And I'm showing this as a computational graph that we talked about on on the right. So you can see here, uh, well, I've got um, the x and the y and the z, and they have certain values, minus 2, 5, and minus 4. And then I have some nodes that represent computation. So for example, I have a plus here that's going to just add uh, what's in the parentheses, the x plus y, that equals 3, right? And then I have a, a multiplication, a product uh, uh, node in my graph that uh, represents the multiplication of 3 times negative 4. That's my uh, x plus y times z. So that's this part here. Okay? All's good there. So uh, the next thing we want to do is uh, think about introducing names to uh, these intermediate nodes because we're going to use them in later computation. So we're just going to call this one Q, and we're going to call this final one F because that's the output of the function, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we would want to do is think about, uh, let's say F is our loss function, right? What we want to do is understand how we're going to, uh, how is X and Y and Z affected by uh, uh, changes in X, Y, and Z? How do they affect F, right? That, that's the idea. So we want to take the partial der derivative of f with respect to these elements, to x and y and z, but there's a problem. All right, what problem is that? Is that we don't have a direct link between x and y and f. Right? We had to calculate that on the basis of q. Now q has a direct relationship with f, and so does z. Right? So what we want to do in backpropagation is calculate these intermediate values, propagate the loss all the way downward through the network, and then use that to influence what we're going to do for, for W. Uh, okay, so here uh, what we've done is uh, we have the, the equations, right, for uh, Q and F, and we're going to take the partial derivatives so that we can get the gradient, right? This is how we're going to figure out what, what's happening, right? So, uh, for example, at Q, what I want to know is how is the final value of uh, f going to change with respect to q. But to do that, maybe what I want to do is just focus on the local gradient of how the input of x and y change with respect to the output q. Right? So to do that, I can take the partial of, uh, of q with respect to x. Right? And that's very easy. Right? The, uh, uh, I just... Um, take the uh, derivative of that and I get 1, right, because the y has no place in x and x goes to 1, and same for uh, dq dy, right, so both of these derivatives are 1, okay, and the uh, same for something like f here, f is over here, it takes as a product uh, q and z, right, so I'm going to take the partial derivative of f with respect to q, well that's easy, the Q drops, I get uh, just Z at the end, and likewise over here, right? So now I have these local uh, gradients, or local partials, but really what I want is, uh, as I said before, I want these three things because I want to know how my inputs are going to change the value of my outputs, right? Now one of them I already have. I already have this one here, right? This one I have. I've got this as uh, this value here. But I want to, you know, calculate further and see how x and y are going to change with respect uh, when I, uh, how f is going to change when I change x and y. Okay? So I'm going to start by doing uh, the differentiation between f and itself. Right? That's 1. Okay? Then I'm going to look at uh, f and... Uh, the derivative of f uh, partial to z, right? 
So that's this formula over here. That's Q, right? So that's easy. I have um, the f of one here. That's here, and uh, the uh, the Q over here. So I'm gonna solve for that, and I'm gonna get um, a four, a three, right? Okay. Then I have to do uh, this partial over here, right? So I take the partial derivative of f with respect to q, and we already know what that is, that's z. So that's going to take this negative 4, okay? So, so far so good, we've passed it through the, fa uh, the first uh, computational unit over here. This one is finished, okay? Then we're going to go do the second half, right? So we have this unit over here that we have to deal with. So we're going to go uh, through um, dq uh, and dy. So in order to get this um, partial derivative of f with respect to y, what do we have to do? So Andermesh was saying we, we invoke our, our, our uh, you know, secondary school or our, our tertiary uh, chain rule, right, for partial derivatives, right? So we want to calculate this, this thing in the magenta box, and we can just use the chain rule to say, well, we've got two partials, one coming through the top loop and the second one from here, chain them together, and then we'll get our, our, our final amount, right? So we can do that. We have all the components here. We have this one, right, which we had calculated earlier. And we have this one, which is right over here, okay? And then we can chain them together, multiply them together, and we're going to get a negative 4, right? And the same for the other one, chain rule again, negative 4, right? So basically what we're saying is, uh, you know, for any part of a large graph, no matter how complex it is, all we're doing is applying invocations of the chain rule all the way down the computation graph, all the way to the input image, right? Okay, and at every node we're thinking about something like this pattern, right? Which we have an input, uh, x and y, uh, and we can uh, differentiate the output with respect to the input variables. These are our local gradients that we did in the first step, right? Once we have the local gradients, we're going to use backpropagation in the chain rule to compute the rest of the, 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 the gradients. Uh, and then finally, we'll know how the, the original input, when it changes, how does the loss function change as a respect to that. Okay? So uh, ideally, you know, this is one node in the graph, but eventually, you know, we might have had many layers on top of that. And at the original first computation, we're thinking about our loss function, right? Because what we're trying to do is minimize our loss function. That's our ultimate objective to figure out what the correct W settings are, right? Okay, so basically the steps are really simple. Uh, we calculate these local gradients with respect to each part of the computation graph. Then we chain rule apply the chain rule from the, uh, the top of the graph from where the loss function was originally calculated, right? because we can calculate the loss, right? And then what we're trying to do is figure out which direction to step in, right? So we need the gradient. So we're going to calculate the gradient by pushing this loss function calculation all the way through all of the local gradients in each node in the computation graph by applying the chain rule. Okay, so we're going to get something out like this and like that. And you can see these two branches could, in fact, be inputs to another node f, right? An f prime or f double prime, farther down in the network. Okay. When I say down, I mean towards the image, towards the original input, towards the original features. Okay. So let's take another example that's uh, a little bit more realistic. Okay. So here we have a another function. It's an exponential, uh, reciprocal of an exponential. And uh, this looks like a pretty familiar form. right? This is a linear regression uh, type of uh, logistic loss. So we have a, 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 a weight w0 right, associated with some uh, input x0. 
W1 associated with some input W1, and W2, which is by itself, which might be, for example, a bias term, right, uh, an intercept. Okay, sometimes this is the, the one that you would call W0 instead of W2. Okay, and when we build this type of computation graph, we could uh, spell it all out. So this is uh, all of the, the operations that are being done, right? So if you can read it, um, it, it should make some sense to you. Let's see. So over here we have um, w0, x0 being multiplied together. So this part of my graph represents this term here, right? Okay. This node here represents the addition between w2 and this other term, right? All of this added together. So at this point, okay, at this point, I have the entire uh, computation graph for this exponent, right? And so on and so forth through the line, okay? So then I have to take it to a negative 1, uh, exponentiate, and then uh, add 1 to it, and then take the reciprocal. So this uh, codifies everything that's in this, this uh, function with respect to the weights. Okay? All good so far? Yes? Okay. Anyone who is lost or, or not clear, please <coughs> ask your question. No? Okay. So how are we going to do this? Uh, again, when we can do it analytically, we can. Uh, so let's try, try to do that. So if we have uh, a function, let's say, for example, uh, 1 over x, right, which is represented by this node here, we can take the analytic uh, a gradient, right? Because there's just uh, x here. So when we differentiate, we get 1 over x squared. Right? Okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to apply that. And we're going to get something like this, right? So we know that analytic term for something uh, as a reciprocal is 1 over x squared. So we just plug in 1 over x squared here. Right? And then we'll get out the the gradient with respect to x just for that uh, component, right? Okay. So how does that work, right? Uh, we have the actual value that was predicted, the score, 0.73, which is the output of this entire network, right? The function value was 0.73. Okay. And we plug this into the formula, right? which was uh, negative 1 over x squared. And we calculate uh, the actual gradient that comes out. So that's this uh, negative 0.53 outside. OK, that's pretty simple. Now we can do it with the rest of these functions here. OK, can anyone help me do the next step? So I have this plus 1 over here. What do I do with that? That should be pretty easy. Sir? That doesn't, do that doesn't do anything, right? If you look at this bottom, this this second line here, right? We have a constant plus x, right? Which is what this represents. Then uh, the function derivative is just 1. All right, so I'm just going to propagate this uh, 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 negative uh, 0.53 down. OK? No problem there. OK? Then we have an exponent. Well, that's pretty easy too. That corresponds to this box over here. So I'm going to take e to the x. I'm going to fill in x, which is point negative uh, five three. Put it through the exponential, and I get uh, another number here. Okay. And then uh, I'm going to multiply it times negative one. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Okay. So I'm just going to times it by negative one because that's the derivative. Okay, and then the rest we've already seen before, right? The, the multiplication and addition. So I'm going to do all of these, right? Together, right? So in this case, we have uh, a case where there's an addition. And so we're actually propagating this addition to both branches because their outputs are going in, in both directions. It's back propagating through both chains, okay? Okay, and then I can do that again for this chain, right? 
Uh, again, the upstream gradient that we have is input, the local gradient that's at that uh, node, and, and then further down. Okay, so there are a number of other functions that uh, uh, can be done. So here we have a, a sigmoid function. Let's see. So you can uh, see here, you have um, e to the negative x, and that was what we're doing here. We're going to see later on that sigmoid gates are, are uh, very important for logistic regression. Right? Does everyone understand what logistic regression is used for? Does anyone not know? Is this way too basic for you guys? No? I, I can't tell because there's no input, so I don't know whether I'm going too fast or too slow. Okay, so I just assume that it's okay because you guys are not making any noise. Okay, so the uh, sigmoid function is helping us to squash um, uh, a score into a probabilistic range, right, from 0 to 1. That's why we're doing it. And so uh, what we'll get out of that is, is a, a value, uh, as you can see here, that's between 0 and 1 because we want a probabilistic interpretation of, of the output of the score. Okay? So you can see what's going on. After the sigmoid gate is applied, we can see how uh, uh, original value uh, of uh, 1 is being turned into a probabilistic value of uh, 70%. Okay? And uh, basically, we can squash all of that computation together into this analytic form, right? So we don't have to do all the internal computation that we were doing before. We can just use this in um, this uh, closed form, calculate that, and to uh, shortcut this uh, internal computation graph, just turn it into this and calculate this directly. Okay. So I guess the point of all of this is to say that you can expand or shrink the computation graph, okay, to the level of resolution that you feel comfortable with. Okay. So when you're doing the computation in your, your, your programs, then uh, you, you, you're welcome to expand it all out and then also do the closed form and make sure, again, that they check each other. So this is very easy to make mistakes in, in doing backpropagation. And the problem with a lot of deep learning algorithms is once you screw it up, you don't know whether you screwed it up. Okay? So uh, it's good to triangulate and make sure that your calculations are indeed correct. Right, so you 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 have a logic branch that says you know uh, if one debug do the detailed expansion if uh, two uh, zero don't do the detailed expansion do the actual closed form computation and that uh, pray that you wrote your code correctly and that it converges to the same value. Okay, so I think those are important uh, lessons to take away. Okay, so there are some patterns in the backward flow, and, and I mean you need your help for this. Uh, to go through this part, okay? So what is a max gate? So we have this gate down here at the bottom. What is it going to do when it, it receives uh, this backward flow coming from um, upstream? It's going to select one of the branches. Why, why is it doing that? Okay, did everyone hear Devamanshu? Did you guys all hear it over here? Was it clear? No? Okay, can, can you repeat yourself a little bit louder? Yeah, uh, so when we were calculating the forward uh, thing, so in this particular graph, there is z and w, and out of z and w, we have the values 2 and minus 1. So when we are calculating the max, only z value is going deeper into the network, and w is getting cut off at that particular node. So finally, when we have the minus 20 as the final output of the graph, the effect of z is bearing that particular minus 20, but not of W. So it makes sense that when we try to optimize that final minus 20 into a low, much into a lower value, we change Z because that is the part which is affecting it. So when the gradient is cal calculated backwards, uh, 
as you can see in this diagram, right, right on uh, to the right of the max, there is this two, which is a gradient uh, in in red. Uh, so that is the gradient which is we are back propagating from the round trip. So it makes sense that we traverse this gradient back towards Z because it affected the loss in the first place. So there is no role of W. And so uh, it gets a zero change. Did everyone hear that explanation? I think that's quite clear. Let's just recap, just to make sure we're clear about that, right? When we're going feed forward, right, we have this max operator. What it's doing is taking both Z, a Z and W, and choosing whichever one is the maximum. And that is being propagated. This is this green value that's going up, right? So when you think of it being back propagated, we're trying to make changes to the inputs Z and W that will affect the final loss function over here of minus 20, right? So if I change W from minus 1 to minus 2 or 0, does it change the actual value over here? Well, no, because this is a max gate. It's only letting the one value that's the maximum do anything, right? So Devamanyu was saying that Basically, this means that when we want to propagate the gradient back through, it only goes to the single branch in the max where it actually made some change. Does this make sense? Because uh, if I change z now to 3, oh, well, then all of this computation will change and uh, the green number at the end will change. Right? But if I change this negative 1 to 0 or minus 2, this is going to be cut off right here because the max will not choose it. Okay, So this is one of the patterns in the back propagation that you will often see. So when you have a max or a soft max, you have to uh, propagate it effectively. It's not always the case that the gradient flows in all parts of your graph like we were showing in earlier parts. Okay, it can get stuck, right? So a max is one of those cases where it acts like a conditional statement. Right? It's saying that I'm going to select one and only one channel of my inputs to feed the gradient through. Okay? So we can think of a max gate as a gradient router. Like I said, it's basically a conditional statement. If maximum, then propagate else zero. Right? We've already saw an add gate, it's basically a distributor, right? It's saying for all of the gates that we saw earlier, like uh, here, right, um, that the addition gate is giving the gradient uh, to both of its input gates. Right? It's just saying, okay, you want a copy? Here, I'll give you one, right? Because that's what the addition does. It says both of the both variables are responsible for uh, a change in the value linearly in in the uh, downstream gate. What about a multiplication gate? What is that doing? So we have another branch up here, which is a multiplication gate. Anyone want to take on that? It's another very common operator that we see. Okay. Can you speak up a little louder for everyone to hear? Because uh, I don't think your voice reaches the other side of the room. Uh, so if we do chain rule on that, so we will have to expand by the product of the uh, value, and that will pass the derivative of minus one minus that with whatever is the value of minus. So that is what is happening. Two will be getting multiplied to three, and getting value as six for the y. Okay, did everyone follow that? Right, you're basically taking the other branch and propagating it uh, over as the gradient on the other side. Uh, the max uh, gradient, uh, actually, the, it should, is it a heuristic just? Because it sh it's not differentiable, right? It's not differential. Huh? Go ahead. Max is different. Sorry? The max kit could be assumed as a constant multiplier to the maximum one. Yes. Like differential in that sense, exactly. Yeah. So but it's conditional, definitely. Yeah. We do for each of the sample. So for that sample, in 
that degree it would be defensible. Max is not defensible as a function of all the elements. But for that particular value, there would be one maximum, and that would be the output of that. Maximum that would be. So for each uh, each data point, you will get a value. But if you want to say that I want to, why don't you write over here? <coughs> So everyone can see. Yes, for that one data sample point, there will be a value for which it will be defensible, and we only want that value. We don't want, we don't care about other values. We are doing the numerical. If we have to write one function which is differentiation of max, we can't write. And we say that we will put all the values. Okay, so Muti wants to say something about uh, another uh, just an example for loss the, function for the uh, question uh, relu right this is uh, this is a very tricky thing so uh, initially I, I was also stumbled uh, when when I encountered this to see how this is differentiable but actually so this exists for all values greater than zero at, at other places it is zero so uh, that if what is the differentiation basically I think this is what Anima was saying uh, so. When, when this exists, you, you just take the differentiation of this, right? And in and, and other cases, the differentiation is zero, right? Correct? Yeah. yeah. And like, they do is not differentiable at x equal to zero. Oh, that's so another that's point. point. Yeah. The point of this continuity or yeah. function changes in the field. But we would never encounter that. We will either be, because all this output will be zero or the other output. So we will differentiate both parts. You don't have to worry that, oh, what happens? Yeah, I see some puzzled faces. Uh, uh, do you guys have questions? You don't have to worry about real value yet. I think uh, what what they're just trying to say, uh, Animesh and Mutu are talking about this particular function, which is acting exactly like what we see over here, right? So the question was about whether uh, the max is differentiable, and the answer was that it is with respect to individual components, right? We don't have to worry about um, the whole, right? We can uh, calculate it for each branch, and for each branch is differentiable. Okay, for the max branch, it's just passing the value through. For the other ones, you're just getting a zero. Okay. So uh, going back to the multiplication gate, like Animesh was just saying just now, we're basically s switching the roles, right? We're taking uh, the the, uh, the other gates and uh, pulling it through for the other side. So as you can see they're, they're basically swapping over here, as we saw in the first example when we did the uh, multiplication, right? So it's just getting a different value because, uh, of course, the gradient coming in is not one, it's two at the beginning. Okay. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay, so uh, when you have networks going the other way, right, so let's say you have two inputs to a gate, then uh, the gradients are adding at the branches, right? And then uh, when you have an entire vector of numbers that you want to put in, rather than a single value, then it starts to get complicated. Then you have your linear algebra that you want to invoke. And then uh, basically your gradient uh, is not a single gradient, but basically uh, a Jacobian matrix, right? Basically partials with respect to each element of the input, right? So you have an input vector coming in, and then you can calculate the partial derivative with respect to each component of the vector, which is then going to form a matrix, right, rather than a single uh, set of numbers, or a vector of numbers for each of the outgoing branches. Now you have a matrix representing all the components of Z and each of the outgoing branches that you, you're, you're getting inputs from. Okay, so it's not any more difficult, it's just, uh, just numerically a little bit more complicated as another for loop that you would have to write. Okay, so uh, you can, I didn't watch the slide for this, so I, I'm starting to go to unexplored territory. 
So uh, I apologize if my presentation gets really rough. Okay, so I'm not actually so sure about what this is going over. So um, yeah, so we have uh, basically a set. Uh, okay, yeah. So thinking about the size of the Jacobian matrix here, uh, you know, to impress upon us how many uh, partial derivatives that we need to get for this. So if let's say I have an output vector that's uh, 4,000 dimensions, right? And then I have this particular uh, uh, box here that is representing this uh, for an element what's the size of the Jacobian matrix that I'd have to compute with respect to all 4,096 uh, uh, 4, inputs? That's a pretty big matrix, right? So it's as a, you know, you got 4,000 by 4,000 just to, to get the partial going through both directions. Do you want to explain how you got that result? With a quick check, uh, everyone is familiar what is Jacobian. Anyone not know what a Jacobian, what Jacobian is? is? Okay. Okay. Do you want to go or on someone explain? Someone who knows can explain. you will get some value and for that's why the value of error with respect to the whole weight matrix will look like a vector where each values these vi are actually the partial derivative vi is a partial derivative it's d upon d w i right now if this initial error is itself an error um, vector then, if, suppose this is a capital del vector, then you will get, if you have to do this with respect to a matrix, you get a big matrix where each indices is actually D of uh, D is, let's write this as uh, D and this, then each is actually del of D upon D w1. So basically what we are having is D D1, D D, Two upon D, can you guys see that on the other side? Yeah, yeah. This is this the this one. Oh, sorry, sorry. D one by D two. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. This is D del D two by D two. Something like that. So basically, you are having for each of the value. This thing. So where does this come into picture? Suppose uh, you have a network. Which is a new network, and you have finally an error value. Most of the time, you will have softmax or some other layer mm -hmm. over top of here. So you will get because as we saw in softmax or max kind of stuff, you will have only one value which is actually output. So you will be calculating error most of the time with respect to one value and all the, these things. So you will most of the time end up doing this. But in some networks, actually, error comes out to be in form of a vector. And now I can't remember which kind of network, but there are examples where you will get error value, which is a vector. In that case, you will be calculating Jacobian of this error vector with respect to all the parameters. Because uh, what we do actually is, when we will be updating this W matrix, suppose this is a this is our X feature, it's going here, X is going here, there is some activation here, some activation here. We have to update this W vector in one shot. So what we have to do is we have to calculate each partial derivative, store in a temporary vector, and in 
after when we have calculated for each next update i plus 1 we in one shot update all the vector but suppose the error is with respect to all the output units then you need to calculate one matrix and update all the vectors in one shot so that's why we can't do it separately for each of the someone can say why do we need to do this at all why can't we break down the bigger problem of calculating with respect to a whole vector as calculating with respect to individual units as we have already done but we can't do that because we have to update the weight vector in one shot always so that's why we have to calculate with respect to the whole uh, vector in form of a chip I think that answers I think there might be some I don't remember which network uh, error comes as uh, but some of the network it does Basically, Jacobi is a generic term for uh, a matrix where each cell is a derivative, first order derivative. Okay. Uh, an extra gyan is if it's a second order derivative, it's called a Hessian matrix. Yeah, these two terms you might come across in the literature. Okay. Yeah. okay. So basically, uh, as Mutu and, and Anamish has pointed out, when you have uh, not single values, not scalars as inputs and outputs, and you have vectors instead, then obviously your computation will be more complex in here, right? And the way to do that is going through a, a matrix, which in this case is the J Jacobian, which is just a partial uh, derivative of each of the inputs, uh, uh, sorry, with respect to that, uh, the, imp the output uh, value with respect to each of the input elements. All right, so we know the size, uh, it was said by this gentleman over here, is uh, uh, 4,000 uh, by 4,000 matrix, so that's a lot of computation that, that we'll have to do to, to get that matrix. Okay, so uh, what, what this is motivating is the fact that this matrix is really getting too out of hand because we actually have to do this calculation very often, right? Because if you think about it, uh, trying to optimize what the W is, we're trying to calculate the gradient of loss, not just for fun. It's part of the steps to optimize what the Ws are. And we have to make many steps towards making the Ws. So if any one of the internal steps takes a long time, that's going to cascade, right? So if you're going to calculate this 4,000 by 4,000 matrix, that's going to take a lot of time. So why do we want to do that when we can get away with some type of approximation that's going to save us time? Okay, yeah, question. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we don't want to do something like that large because um, it would be just too much work. Okay, so in practice, what we are going to do is uh, do only a certain number of examples at a time through the network so we can get an approximate gradient you know, a, a sample gradient from just a couple data points here, about a hundred data points, as they said, for a mini batch. Okay, calculate the, the gradient with respect to just a hundred data points, take a step in that direction, and then calculate a, a, a gradient again, but for a different sample of 100 points. Not necessarily the same one. Yeah. Right, so that's that's this product down here, right? Technically. So this this is if we have a hundred points in our uh, our mini batch, then we have to calculate this uh, for each of the hundred points. So then the Jacobian would be a hundred times larger in each of the, the two dimensions. Yeah, and you can get you can see this is a quite an unreasonable number of calculations just to do that. Actually, I think you wanted to say it should be hundred multiplied with that, right? Because for each point you will get one degree. That's that's in the sense that now it's no, but yeah. even then. Question. How do you decide uh, the subset of the whole set of data? I mean, how would you decide the hundred? Or how do you decide? What sample of points to yeah, do the mini batch? Yeah, because it should represent the whole data set. Yeah, I, I mean, ideally, you want to create a, a, a sample that's representative 
of, of your your entire data set. In practice, selective, uh, uh, selecting a representative's example is also time consuming. Okay, so many people, when we do stochastic gradient descent, we don't even bother to calculate representativeness. Okay, so what we do uh, instead is we take lots of these stochastic steps, which uh, uh, when you add them all together, they average out to be the sample, uh, the sample representing the entire, uh, that is representative of the entire sample. I don't know whether that makes a lot of sense. So basically, when you sample many, many batches, the law of large numbers will tell us that the sample will be representative of the uh, population mean. Right? So instead of guaranteeing any mini batch is representative, we don't even bother with that. So what that means in, in gradient descent is if you remember that diagram that we showed earlier. Okay, this is not working. Right? Where we have some type of contour, we're going down into this area. Right? We start off here and we might make a step in this direction, and that might be the optimal path. But instead, when we do a mini batch, Let's say we pick 100 points. Those 100 points aren't representative. We we could be instead going in a slightly different direction, right? Maybe we'll go over here, and then we're going over here, and then we're going this way and that way. Okay. So the mini batches will lead you in different directions, but the law of large numbers will hold that eventually you'll converge to the the sample, uh, the population mean. Okay. So um, that. That's a nice shortcut that instead of choosing a representative sample, instead of going through all the data points and calculating the gradient uh, correctly once, you just calculate a sample gradient many times and take small steps. Okay? And that actually, actually ends up having the same result, but computationally much, much, much more efficient because you don't have this exponential blow up that you'll see by calculating the full amount. Yes? So why is it becoming uh, 0.096 to 100 into another 100? Like, it should be 100 in one yeah. time, right? Yeah, I think Andamesh was saying this This probably is not quite right. We're not quite sure. I'm not, I'm not because really that uh, examples are It should be this times 100. Yeah. So you would have to do that 100 times separately rather than something like this. Okay, but I, I'm not sure about this. I, I had to watch the video. and. Might be able to get a good uh, explanation from the Stanford lectures. Okay. Any questions? This is good. I, I mean, I'm I'm not that familiar with the material, so I want us all to participate. This this helps everyone, including myself. I think one of the questions we had was how do you decide that hundred, right? So, so that's a that's a parameter called mini band size. So you, you need to provide that into your TensorFlow or whatever your thing, and you need to repeat your experiments for different mini band sizes. That's a parameter you need to optimize. Can you speak up? I can't even hear you. Here we are just taking for the sake of simplicity because when you multiply 100, we can see how the magnitude is. But in practice, most of the time, the mini batch size is of, you can guess, by 2 to the power n. Because why? Mini batch is the thing which will be frequently swapped out and in. Want to allocate it's a fixed, and we know from the RAM concept, a fixed n bit size address such that it frequently can be switched without a lot of problems. Computer science people will get it right. We want it to be an n bit size, like 2 to the power k order, such that that mini batch, because during training, the mini batch is the only parameter in the memory which will be frequently switched. Right? You want a very efficient use of that memory. How can we use that by giving a mini batch size of two to the power k? <coughs> I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, yeah, so but why, um, so, so, so what is the reason again? Uh, so what happens when we are training and we will like perform any shot, not only a big training or anything. We need, we need, some, we have a big batch, a lot of data points, maybe like hundreds of, and then we divide into small portions which are called mini batch. At the time, a mini batch is fed into the network. For, for, uh, we calculate the, we do the forward for prop, we calculate the error, and we do the backward prop. Right? This is one complete computation with one set of data points. Then we swap that data point out of memory, load another set of data points, 
do same operation. We do this from start to the end. So in one round, you will have seen all the data points. This one complete step is called one epoch, right? Now, what we are doing, and then you will do multiple epochs as well. So what is the most time consuming, if you see from computer science of view, what is the most time consuming step in this is, apart from the calculation, is the frequent swap in and swap out of these many data points, right? So data points is what we are having the mini bad side. So you will see most of the practical code, the mini bad size of two to the power k order. Because that will is that is the most efficient use of n bits memory what I want to have. Why? Because RAM is um, the address in the RAM is given in the order of two, it's multiple of two to the power n bits. So even if you are not using two to the yeah, yeah, I, I was saying that. Even if you don't use 2 to the power n, your minimum swap and swap out will happen in order of 2 to the power n. So why don't you finish your question first, Zalin? If your back side, even if you choose the back side, to be 2 to the power n, so the actual back side has no relation to the, like, you know, you buy the line. Right, but the point is, minimum swap, that much swap is going to happen every time. So you, if you are having some data point, why not utilize the full swap which you are going to do? Basically, you suppose you use 123, much, uh, then you could have used three modes and made it more efficient for the processor, as well as use three more points. So, so how much? Well, I think the important part here is that, you know, uh, in, in von Neumann machines right now, right, our, our computer architectures, we have hierarchical memory, right? So you have RAM, you have register address, right? So register memory works very fast, RAM works the second order, and then you have flash and, and hard drive, right? So you just want to make sure that the amount of data that you're putting in to your CPU or GPU unit, right, the memory that it has allocated is fully utilized. That's what Anna Mesh is saying. So you want to make sure that uh, when you go into a computation of a gradient all the way through your factor, your computation graph, that you only have enough points in the mini batch so that you can do those computations locally efficiently at that point of computation. So on that GPU core, for instance, or on that CPU core. Yeah. Yeah. Right. As you said, uh, one more point to add. Usually what happens in computational graph, for input you will also have a node. It's most of the time. Most of the time, like in Numpy or in Piano, this node is called a shared variable. Shared variable is a variable which is size on RAM so that you don't have to swap it more frequently. So the shared variable you will initialize with the initial size. It's much better to initialize with the size of 2 to the power k rather than to initialize with the random size. Uh, I agree with that. I agree with that. That's because the same thing that uh, usually uh, like for instance, the SSD. Uh, yes, SSD exactly. For they operate on a one to kind of, uh, So, so it's Yeah, I think all those parameters which are ultimately going to affect your input vector should be in some easy computable order such that that matrix can be easily multiplied Yeah, I, I think again the, the key point is that we want to utilize whatever memory that we have as efficiently as possible, right? So when we, we either under allocate, which means we, we could get a couple more data points, and I guess that uh, Devamanshu was saying, I don't think it necessarily has to be a power of two. It depends on the size of your data point, right? How many dimensions there are and what precision your data points are. 
right? That basically you want to make sure your RAM or your register memory is filled to capacity so that when you go through the computation graph, you can do it in one shot without swapping. Think as, as soon as we go to swapping, we know that things are going to get very inefficient because the processor, the OS has to get things in and out of, of, of the GPU or CPU. Does that, I think that's what we're trying to say. It's not always the case. Data is like that, you have to use or something on tablet or that. So you have to use that. There's no difference. But for okay. the price, it's better. Okay, Amutu, you wanted to say something? You wrote something oh, on the board. I, I just wanted to make sure that what everyone is familiar with what we are talking about. This, why we, we were talking about this idea of mini batch size that. Um, this comes into the picture only in stochastic gradient descent, where we have this concept called mini batch size. Okay, normal in in non deep learning gradient descent, we do the weight update after going through the entire set of data points once, and it is called an epoch. Okay, in in, in stochastic gradient descent, what we do is we update the weights after uh, going through this mini batch. Okay, so that's the whole uh, discussion was on that, that point. In case someone was not following. Question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so in this uh, diagram, you can see that uh, the word element wise. So the slide basically represents that here is 4096 uh, points in the input, and each point is element wise. Uh, that effects of operation is applied to each point. So. Uh, The effect of this particular point is on the here, this is on here, and so on. So max is applied for each point, and we get the output. So a uh, simple question would be, uh, for this particular example, uh, how do you think uh, the Jacobian matrix will be? What kind of the? Yeah, so which elements are going to be 0? So. So for these n points, suppose there are n columns in a Jacobian, and for these m points, here it will be n. So here, so the this Jacobian matrix will be diagonal matrix where here the differentiations will be there, and rest all are going to be zero. So these are some kind of uh, hacks which are applied to the softwares which people write. So you take TensorFlow, Theano, whatever. So uh, whenever there is a uh, in the computational graph, if there is an operation with element-wise transformation, then they're smart enough not to calculate the whole Jacobian matrix, but only this particular Just thing, the and then move on. So this is, these are small tricks which, if you in future create your own library or something, you need to keep in mind to speed up your code and not do just everything. So this was one example which was missing. Did everyone catch that? Did somebody miss it? Okay, I, I'll paraphrase and then you can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so because of, uh, of the idea of having element wise, which means you have one input to one output, that means our J Jacobian matrix is not uh, full, right? It's basically just a diagonal matrix, right? So that makes it a much more efficient if uh, you can realize that at the beginning, right? And that's just because of a function of this max that's element wise, right? So when we have that particular formulation, we get a special matrix. Uh, um, characteristic which we can capitalize on instead of uh, having to do the full Jacobian wasting a lot of compute cycles. Right? Okay, great. Thank you for the help. So let's go on. Uh, I don't know how many more slides we have. So again, those of you who watch lectures, please help out. So we're going to go to the vectorized form. Right? So we have a uh, uh, a, a two norm here, uh, uh, just a linear one, right? So here we're taking um, each of the elements and then multiplying it by its weight and then uh, taking uh, the two norm for that. So let's take a look at what that means. So uh, basically we have the x's which are in uh, real space, right, for n elements and our w's then we're going to have n cross n for our, our w matrix. Does anyone know why it's n cross n? Let's make sure we're, we're clear about that. Because the inputs of size n and you want the output of size n. So 
n by n matrix multiply by uh, n by one one factor of two over n by one. Okay. Do you all agree with that? Okay. So let's see what happens when we pass um, some uh, a vector through something like this. This is our uh, L two norm represented over here, and then the multiplication that we're doing inside, right? So that's represented quite succinctly. So we're going to get something like this. Um, we have our weight vectors, uh, sorry, our weight matrix, and our uh, vector as input. And, and basically, we have to compute um, this output uh, when we do the multiplication together. That's our Q, right? This is our, 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 our Q unit over here, OK? So uh, we're going to get uh, our, our finally as our output our f right. So if we're going to um, annotate it, we should write f over here and q over here. Okay. Then we're going to take the two norm of q, which is the output of here, and then uh, basically do the element uh, wise uh, square of this uh, to sum them together. Okay, so uh, after we do the computation, we'll get out uh, uh, a scalar at the end, which represents our loss after we have the input vector of two dimensions and, and the weights for that. Okay, then we need to do the back propagation, right? This is the, the part where we want to uh, influence how our weights are going to be. So we start with uh, having uh, a, a single unit gradient over here, and we want to back propagate it through the rest. So again, uh, as what we said, uh, we're going to take uh, the, the analytic gradient of each of these and then pass it through to see what the gradients look like uh, on the other side. So we're first going to differentiate uh, f, the final output, with respect to each of the elements in qi. Right? So q has uh, two parts, right? uh, uh, q1 and q2. We differentiate it and we get uh, two qi, right? Because we have this uh, the square there. Okay, everyone's happy with that, right? Okay, so we're gonna propagate that, and uh, then we we get these values over here. That was pretty straightforward. Okay, and then we have to do uh, the computation for w and x separately, right? So we're gonna take the partial derivative of each of these. Uh, gradients, right, these partial derivatives for the individual components of uh, Q with respect to each of the uh, elements within our W matrix, right? So this is getting a little bit complex, but uh, the analytic form is very easy, right? So we have this uh, just a unit value uh, for each of the uh, cases where K equals I uh, uh, XJ. Okay, so uh, you can plug this in, right? You're going to take this formula and uh, meld it with what we had in our L2, and you'll get out uh, this equation at the end. Shall we do the math for that? Okay, so we have uh, this one here, which we had before, right? This uh, uh, partial derivative of f with respect to uh, um, Q, uh, Q, K, right, which we calculated before right over here. Um, so we're going to substitute that. That was what the result we got on the last slide. Right? And then we have uh, this chain rule application, right? Because we're basically applying the chain rule here as we did before. And we have this uh, component which we're putting over here. Right? So we just multiply that together and we, we're going to get this. Okay? So we'll get a, a final value out for uh, w when we do that, okay? And uh, we want to do the same thing for x, okay? So we're going to do that with respect to x. Uh, let's see, what did they want to tell us about this? Always check the gradient with respect to the variable should have the same same shape as the variable. Right, so this is just another uh, a check when you're doing the, the computations that your gradients have the same shape as the inputs, right? So if you have a vector of size 2, you should have a vector of size 2 for your gradient. That should be 
hopefully pretty obvious. But if you're getting a different shape, you're obviously doing the, the math incorrectly. So here we have a 2 by 2 matrix for the inputs, and our gradients are also 2 by 2. Okay, so we're going to have to do this other branch, right, for x. So we have here, right, um, partial derivative of each of the values of uh, the gradient of 0.44 and 0.52 with respect to xi. Here we have a vector, right, just two components. It's just going to be the weight of uh, uh, ki. So that's not so bad. So again, we're applying the chain rule. So we had the chain rule from before, uh, which we calculated from the L2 part. We have just propagated that in. That's this part here, D2QK. Uh, and then uh, we brought this term over here. Okay, and we can sum those together, and we'll get that, right? You know, calculating that analytically. And we finally get the, the gradient of uh, F with respect to X as 2 times the the transpose of the uh, weight matrix times Q, right? Uh, Q is the factor in, in the middle there. Okay, so um, I don't know what this part is. Uh, did anyone watch this part? Okay, basically I think all, all that we're trying to say here is that when you're doing back propagation, you first have to do the forward pass, right? So uh, that's what you see in the, in the first part of the code here is that you're taking the values that you have uh, on X, you know, all of the inputs, all of the green values, right? And you're going to do the forward pass to calculate all of the intermediate values going all the way to the end of the computation graph, right? To end up with this value 0.73. So that just represents, you know, given these inputs, through this particular computation, which is, I forget, some negative, a reciprocal negative exponential uh, of, uh, of uh, yeah, a, a logistic regression, basically we're going to get out a, a particular value, 0.73, which represents a po probability, right? Okay, so that's the first part of the this, right? Pass the inputs to the input gates over here, then do forward through the computational graph by doing a, a topological sort. So I know that these nodes come first. So I'm going to compute everything where I have the, the inputs already satisfied and computed. Right? So I compute that, I get an output, and I go uh, topologically through this graph all the way down. Right? Then I have to do the back propagation, which is what we've been talking about for the entire uh, part of the lecture. And then we're going to do it in reverse topological order. We start from uh, the final part where we say, okay, we initially have a gradient of 1 okay, uh, for, for the scalar value that's represented as the output of uh, my loss function. And then I'm just going to back propagate it all the way through. Right? So it's this uh, for gate in reverse, to, uh, gate backwards. Uh, do the back propagation for just the local uh, node, right? And then um, return the input gradient. So each time we're going through the gradient, we're composing a little bit more of the, um, the chain from uh, to do the partial derivative of f all the way from the back of the graph all the way towards the front. Okay, so this is the forward and back pass and back propagation. Okay, so um, we can do this by uh, thinking of each of the different types of gate and um, uh, depending on what type of gate it is, uh, call the appropriate uh, back propagation piece of code that calculates the gradient for that local component, right? So that's what they're showing you here. So for a multiply gate, uh, you would have uh, uh, function that calculates the forward value, which is really easy, right? If I have a forward multiplication, I just take the two value times it, and I return z, right? On the backward propagation, then I have to basically calculate um, this piece of uh, these pieces of information for the incoming information, right? So I have the the gradient z coming in. When I go backwards, right, this is the um, the partial, the gradient with respect to the final loss, uh, the gradient of the loss with respect to z, the incoming gate, 
And then uh, for each of the incoming branches, I have to calculate what I want to do with those, right? So I'm going to actually, at the end, return the inputs, right? Uh, which is going to be the loss function, uh, uh, partial of the loss function with respect to x or y, right? The, the inputs. That's all clear, right? Okay. So uh, then I, I can do the actual uh, computation. Okay. And then here we're, we're storing these values within uh, our, our class because we'll need it for the backward task here. Right? So I, I need these values that were computed in the forward pass uh, to swap them when I do the backward pass here. You can see the, the swapping is done in this case uh, when we have just two branches over here where we have the X and the Y being swapped um, for each of these. Right? Okay, so we can do this for a multiplication gate. We would have another extension for uh, addition gate, another extension for a max gate, etc. Let's see. So, uh, ooh, I can't read this at all. Um, yeah, so there are just uh, different uh, layers that you can, that have already been uh, implemented that are in uh, various libraries. So the, I think they're looking at a cafe here. Uh, but it could be for PyTorch, it could be for TensorFlow, or any other uh, toolkit that you're using, Chainer. Okay. So um, they're looking at some particular uh, layer. So I don't know whether you can read this. Uh, let's see. I don't think I can blow this up. Okay. So yeah, that's basically it for today. So uh, the summary so far, uh, we see that even though we might have a very large neural network architecture, the basic mechanism that we're doing the training is very, very simple. It's just a forward pass to compute the actual loss function as a result of having the inputs, and then calculate in the gradient using backpropagation so that I can know where to step. And when we're doing that backpropagation again, as we said, that if we use the entire data set to compute the actual gradient, that can be terribly expensive. So as we saw in the middle of lecture, you know, there was this mention of mini batch. We usually don't use the whole data set. We just select a sample. It doesn't necessarily need to be representative. We use that sample to calculate the backward propagation to get to the, uh, um, all the way through to the input layer to decide which direction to change our values of W to make an appropriate step. Okay, so uh, again, we can think of backpropagation as basically just using the chain rule. Basically, every time we're doing one layer through the backpropagation, we're adding another part of the chain rule to the multiplication, going down, going down, and just um, basically uh, multiplying all the factors together until we get to the original uh, inputs. Okay, so I think that's, yeah, oh, there's more. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Let's let's see how fast we can cover this. Okay. So um, basically, what we were talking about is just having some uh, computational graph, right, to do the forward and back propagation, right. And uh, we can uh, layer these uh, in some way, right? So we're basically taking uh, a single uh, uh, linear function, which could be logistic regression. It could be you know, linear regression. And then layering them on top of each other. So taking the output of uh, one layer and feeding it into another, right? So now we could have a two-layer network or, or more than that. So um, uh, we can array that. And basically what we can think of is uh, something like this. We might have an input that represents uh, an image, maybe having 3,000 uh, floating point numbers. And we are first going to use uh, one uh, neural network, uh, just with one layer, with a certain amount of weights to get to uh, a smaller number of units. Okay, so we're gonna induce uh, 100 outputs, okay, and then pull those hundred outputs into another layer 
to get a, another set of scores for uh, of size 10. So this size 10 could be, for example, uh, the scores for any one of the classes of an object. So if you were here on the first two lectures, we mentioned uh, some of the uh, feature image classification uh, data sets that have maybe 10 classes of objects, airplanes, cars, and trains. So um, this uh, score vector would represent the confidence value that you saw a cat or an airplane or any one of the, the uh, 10 feature classes, uh, output classes. Okay, so um, this was what we had uh, shown before is that when we uh, do back propagation, we push all of these scores all the way out back to uh, this uh, original input we can reconstruct what these uh, 3072 uh, signals look like, right? So um, uh, basically, if I have something like 100 by 100 by 3, okay, which could be uh, a square image with RGB channels, okay, then I can reconstruct uh, this vector into basically, uh, basically a, a square matrix that would represent something like an image like this. And so what we saw last time was that uh, the representation that we had in, in this uh, could be like a horse, where uh, we can see that you might have uh, a horse that looks like it has two heads, because uh, in this neural network it's forced to make a single representation for horse pictures, and horse pictures typically look at you know the profile picture of the horse, either left to the right. Okay, so you, you don't have to stop at two, you could have three, you could have two, uh, or, or much larger than that. Okay, and in fact, uh, training that uh, layer is not, uh, these networks is not hard, because you just need to uh, create uh, the layers individually, and then uh, pull them together um, uh, through the code. All right, so it's just uh, computationally expensive, but easy to write. Okay, so uh, this is what we were talking about briefly earlier about um, what is the biological inspiration uh, for a, a, a neuron, right? So we can say that uh, you have some inputs that are carried towards a cell body uh, from some other neurons, and then if it reaches some threshold, right, that neuron fires, and then the impulse is carried along the axon, and then touches other uh, neurons which might get activated. So this is how uh, we can think of that biological uh, model influencing how we are structuring our neural network. right? So you can think of it like this. We have uh, an input, right? x1 and x2 coming from other neurons. We have uh, a particular uh, bias uh, or maybe another neuron connecting this that's going to tell us uh, whether or not those inputs are going to uh, come into the cell body and trigger it. Right. So if we have a linear uh, system, basically this is saying that all of these uh, inputs that are coming in here are giving some uh, linear accumulation of the signal. Okay. And then at some point this cell body is activated right, by some activation function. This is our F. Okay, and then uh, the F is going to uh, create a signal S, uh, which is going to be carried to the output axon and, and firing other other downstream or upstream uh, layers, as it there, as it were. Okay, so many times this activation function we can think of as uh, having a probabilistic interpretation. Right? We can say either a neuron fires or it doesn't fire, and sometimes in the middle, uh, to make it differentiable, uh, we'll, we'll use a, a continuous curve rather than a, a zero one loss that you, you see in other classification tasks. And, and we use a sigmoid function because why? It's really simple, right? When we take the derivative, it becomes a, a very simple thing to do. Okay, and that's also why we, we use another uh, loss function, the ReLU uh, unit, which is uh, what uh, Mutu and, and Animesh were talking about before, which also has a nice differentiable form of just being linear. Okay, so um, uh, this is basically uh, 
what we have to do to write that out, right? Uh, to, to write a, a sigmoid activation function and, and then decide whether the neuron fires or not. Okay, like we were saying earlier, you know, the brain analogies don't go very far. In fact, in, in, in a lot of neural network uh, literature, we're very careful about that, not to really say that they're neural networks, but more like units of computation, right? So um, we, we don't want to stretch that analogy too far. So there are lots of different activation functions, and uh, I guess throughout the course we're going to hear more about those. So uh, the ones that you've probably heard more traditionally about in the statistics would be the sigmoid and the uh, hyperbolic tangent function, but there are a number of other uh, functions that also have nice properties, and I think we will discuss them more later, not, not at this point in the course. So uh, we touched upon ReLU, that's very simple, right? Take the maximum of uh, 0 and x, and you can think of that uh, very similar to the hinge loss that we introduced earlier for multi-class classification uh, two weeks ago, and, and so we have uh, other versions of that as well. Okay? So I don't think there's this much else, right? So uh, you can think of... Uh, different architectures and we're going to go over this in detail in the next couple of, of lectures so I don't think we need to to go in too much here okay yeah so um, next time we're going to have convolutional neural networks as uh, the first part that's after this uh, technical part to do back propagation and uh, just a reminder about uh, who's doing that for next week. Uh, let's go see. Okay, so um, Deva Manu who answered some of the questions today. Siddharth, are you around? Okay. Uh, Aravin? Oh, that's, oh, sorry. My bad. Uh, Ming Ray? Okay, uh, Yachi, okay, Kenneth, okay, and Kok uh, Kyung. Kok is not here. Okay, so all of you, hopefully you will join uh, week four prep, okay, uh, coordinate with each other to review the materials, split up your duties, and uh, next time we'll be here at, again, six o'clock, and hopefully you'll be ready to present. Okay, a question, Yachi. Yeah, you can do it both ways. Uh, you can ask questions directly to the presenters. You can tell them, hey, I'm going to ask this question. Or, you know, uh, uh, there is a question that was presented by Serena or Justin. I'm going to answer it uh, when you ask that in, in class as the presenter. So either way, you can be the person answering the question if it was on the slide, or you can bring it up uh, as a topic uh, for discussion. So, for example, if you found part of the lecture hard to follow and you were able to figure out uh, it with some other lectures help then please you know bring that topic up because a lot of times I think people are reluctant to speak up when they have some misunderstanding uh, because you rather not say uh, but I think as a study group it's our, our imperative to work together to make sure everyone is on the same page does that answer your question Okay, I would encourage you, you guys who are presenting next week, to record your lecture as I'm doing now, okay, and then uh, put it on YouTube, okay. Uh, it's actually good practice for you, I, I mean, uh, to do it, and it will eventually help others. You, you never know how bad your presentation is still going to help others, because there's so many people who would like to learn. So I think the more exposure that we have uh, as a community, putting our names out there and saying, look, we're, we're trying to understand this stuff, will help. Okay, so I, I would like, I would urge you to do that, but I'm not going to require it. Okay, so again, if you completely don't feel comfortable as a team, don't bother to do it, okay? But I would definitely encourage you to try to make a recording and, and then put it on YouTube, okay? That, that will produce better gains for the entire community and, and indirectly for all of you, okay? All right, so I think that's all I want to present today. So uh, thank you for coming. So uh, we'll see you next week.
uh, for those of you who are in session one. If there are any uh, presenters for session two, that means week eight through uh, 13, you can come and talk to me as well. Okay.